This is one project that is it's so much publicity for one little tiny project and fantasy images that one sees that are extremely seductive. I mean, we were seduced ourselves. Like I say, we thought, where is the robot? We want to just press the button and go. But when you actually get down there and like, oh, you know, here's the design. There's the site. There's a bit of a gap to be filled there. But creating something that's permanent, that's suitable for human inhabitation, and that can also take the structural loading is another level of challenge. You know, 3D printing doesn't make things cheaper. It doesn't make them faster. It essentially gives more control over the form of a surface and translating that essentially from a digital surface into a physical surface. The relationship between robots and construction and what, you know, what does 3D printing actually mean uh, is a kind of a blurry thing. My name is Ben Piper and I'm an architect and a design principal with Killer Design, a firm of about 80 architects based in Dubai. About five years now, I've managed to do some quite interesting projects, uh, the Museum of the Future at the Address Resort in Dubai and the Office of the Future, which won a Guinness Book of Records award for being the first fully inhabited 3D printed building we can talk about today. And we have a, we have a little model of it right here. We're based in the Middle East. Uh, we have a few projects in the UAE, in Dubai, in the, in the broader UAE, Abu Dhabi and some of the Northern Emirates, and then from there into Oman and Saudi, which are our neighbors. In India, in the Seychelles, we're looking to expand. That's 2017, study the possibility of putting uh, the, the world's first 3D printed, fully inhabited building uh, in that location. It was due to be constructed in, in Abu Dhabi, which is our neighboring emirate. But there's a kind of uh, good friendly rivalry between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And Dubai likes to be the first and the largest in the things that they do. For example, the Burj Khalifa being the, the world's tallest tower, the Dubai Future Foundation. They were interested in promoting 3D rapid prototyping technology at a larger scale, a 3D printed building scale. And so we were invited to assist them in reimagining what was originally a villa project, uh, but for a new site in a very central location in Dubai. There's absolutely a lot of precedent for 3D printed constructions, you could say. But most of those, uh, anecdotally, were kind of pavilion scale constructions and not really environmental envelopes. But creating something that's permanent, that's suitable for human inhabitation, and that can also take the structural loading is, is another level of challenge. The end result may be slightly less flamboyant, but the, the, the meaning and the impact is slightly deeper because it's a completely different way to procuring traditional buildings. The supplier of the 3D printed concrete, uh, which is an entity called Windsun, working out of China, were actually driving the project from the outset. They, they essentially were trying to promote their 3D printing technology uh, by first of all offering to print at no cost. Other consultants, Gensler and Thornton Tomasetti involved, our role really was taking the more or less kit of parts that had been established already um, and then trying to reassemble them to fit onto the site. Gallery space. This is the, the gateway entry. This is the lobby space. This was a sort of consultant a workshop area, private offices, and then this is the executive office. Half of the, the kit of parts was already 3D printed and already in, in transit. The fabricator of the 3D printed elements was sort of saying, you know, here's some 3D printed building blocks. Now you go and figure out what to do with them, which is absolutely not, not an ideal scenario because I think the real interesting part of 3D printed architecture is this idea of absolute customization at relatively little cost. It's very irregular, uh, kind of dynamically shaped. It's maybe something that's highly responsive either to the site or to environmental conditions. And we are very interested in all of those kind of things, but this particular project was more of an exercise in delivery, pretty rapid amount of time. And also that the, the 3D printed elements are structural concrete. So in the sense that they're used to form actual slabs and roofs. This is quite groundbreaking. Uh, there's 3D printed um, elements of buildings that have been used before, but to create the actual envelope and the, and the structure in 3D printed concrete was, was quite unique. We call them cassettes. They're like a C shapes that are, are brought together uh, like this. And this, in this gateway element, vertical, composition, a kind of exciting moment of, of entry. And inside that's forming the volumes around. 
these volumes are kind of slipping past each other. So it's kind of like tilt up construction. It did as a circle on the ground and then tilt it up. Wherever you are using concrete, a combination of concrete and steel working together. You take the steel out of a concrete building and it'll fall over. This is a 3D printed concrete building with steel embedments. Every six inches, call it six inches or 12 layers of, of uh, ejected concrete mix. And uh, as it was hardening, a layer of rebar was added and then it would go off and then another 12 layers would be added on top. What are some of the limitations you found structure? Trying to 3D print a slab while the concrete hasn't set is, is nigh on impossible. And of course there have been, you know, a lot of experiments into rapidly setting concrete, ultraviolet set material. Volume is filled with a single material, essentially a powder. But yeah, one of the major um, challenges is you do need to support the 3D printed concrete before it goes off. Uh, and then only once it's essentially set can you then use it as a spanning structure. But then the next problem is the absolute volume of material you're dealing with. Essentially, you have to have a volume of material equivalent to the entire yeah. volume taken up by the building, the actual print volume um, and, and the, the assembly that was printing the concrete set by the 40 foot container so that it was possible to, to ship these things. Um, then there was uh, constraints to do with span, essentially the structural engineers calculations of what they felt they could get away with. But at the end of the day, structural engineering depends on historical data. And there isn't too much historical data about the performance of 3D printed concrete. The, the layers have a, a, a structural relationship with each other. Plus there, within those layers, there's an additional steel members and the bonding strength between the steel and the concrete has to to play into all these things and to make an educated guess about what they could get away with. It wasn't necessarily the, the absolute end. Uh, and they also performed a, you know, a, some destructive tests by putting these uh, large uh, beam elements uh, under, under strain until they, until they failed, essentially. Physics really starts to play a role when you start working at uh, scale. It's five meters wide by 17 meters long. One of the things that actually starts to happen is when the concrete is laid down in layers, its self-weight starts to compress and it basically starts to deform under its own, under its own self-weight. So you, you can't just keep printing perpetually, you know, a taller and a taller thing. Physics comes into play. In this case, it's 12 layers of concrete before you have to wait for it to harden, one and a half centimeters. Um, and so you're getting about a six inch layer uh, at any one time, because if you go beyond that, it starts distorting and something to such an extent that you can't keep the shape. You, know, you can use it for printing jewelry, you know, something with micron tolerances. Yeah. But once you blow this thing up, what we found is actually with all of this something and everything, you get really major uh, imprecision. Um, and far more so than you would expect in a precast. When you 3D print at scale, um, the actual physical forces, particularly in, before the thing is set, uh, introduce all sorts of intolerances. So, for example, the glazing, as we came to put the glazing in, and we had put a 50 millimeter tolerance factor in, but still uh, we had to change the glass and cut, cut the glass back and kind of, you know, wedge it in because of all of that uh, physical distortion. There's no reason that you couldn't use software to take out that, that noise factor or that distortion factor. I personally have an issue with the idea of 3D printing housing at mass scale. Housing doesn't demand the requirements for freeform or optimized shape. The requirements of, it, of individual houses are not so different from each other that they can't be mass produced. So once you've optimized the shape, say with a very sophisticated mold or algorithm or whatever, that thing can be, can be reproduced much more effectively using other techniques than 3D printing. You know, 3D printing doesn't make things cheaper, it doesn't make them faster. It essentially gives more control over the form of a surface and translating that from a, essentially from a digital surface into a physical surface. Now, once it's translated into a physical surface, it's possible to do many things with that, including turning it into a mold or using it for form work. Fantasy images that one sees that are extremely uh, seductive. I mean, we were seduced ourselves. Like I say, we thought, where's the robot? We want to just press the button and go. But when you actually get down there and like, Oh, you know, here's the design, there's the site, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a gap uh, to be filled uh, there, you know, set within the context of legal and health and safety requirements and building codes and such like. And the challenge of, of, of building buildings is not really a technical challenge. I mean, at the end of the day, buildings are simple things. 
Um, it's really building the consensus amongst a whole number of people uh, working at all sorts of different levels within society to come together. And that's, that's what creates the construction. And 3D printing doesn't take away that complexity. If anything, it adds to it. It does, absolutely, because then you've got a whole other kind of logistical aspect. If, you know, cracks start appearing, do you, do you go after the robot manufacturer, after the guy who, you know, patented the formula for the 3D printed concrete, or the guy who put the steel in to the 3D printed concrete, but it wasn't the right thickness. So there's a lot of kind of legal aspects. Or this was an exercise in pragmatism, the real world constraints layered on top of the challenge of actually trying to make a 3D printed building. The constraints of intellectual property, so sort the of deadline, the ruler of the country already booking into his diary when he would be opening the first 3D printed building in the world. We didn't actually have to go through a highly formalized building approval process. I mean, the building authorities wouldn't have known how to deal with it at all. It would have failed from that point. So it was partly to do with the having the right support from the highest levels so that we haven't experienced any problems so far and people are using the building in an everyday manner. Relationship between uh, robots and construction, what does 3D printing actually mean? It's a kind of a blurry thing. Is there a relationship between low tech and high tech? It's very alluring somehow that you could take essentially mud and turn it into magically controlled kind of material. The thing that's quite unique about 3D printing specifically is that you can very accurately control a form in a way that wasn't possible before. And I think that's one of the shortcomings of this project is it didn't really push the possibility for form making uh, as much as, as it could have um, uh, because it was constrained by the, the time frame that the contractor had already kind of had their idea of what the, the components were. You know, if you're going to use a tool, use it for the thing that that tool does best. And the 3D printing in construction is particularly suited to form work. Uh, printing, more traditional methods like CNC, handmade carpentry, and the idea of being able to 3D print the mold, and the many thousands of year history of concrete and its mixture and its reinforcement to play. And you don't have to throw all that down the drain. You can say, let's take something that's working great, make it do something that wasn't possible, or at least not possible in economic terms. And that's where you might start to see much more kind of organic design structure in terms of bone or plant forms or shell forms and, and such like. So you get these incredibly beautiful, rich and complex structures because the constraint has been pure optimization, not easiest way to construct. You know, your average standard building, it's more driven by the pragmatism of keeping construction simple and straightforward than by pure optimization without that, that constraint. Another extremely interesting thing to consider as well is is sort of customized building blocks. Building out a brick, every brick is the same. But now we have the possibility to make every brick unique without necessarily making it more costly. For example, a brick molding machine is able to rapidly generate uh, bricks that had their absolutely unique, identifiable address in a building. That brick could be optimized for structure. It could be optimized for, for its form. The age of mechanical reproduction, we're very much defined in the way that we do things now by materials that have already been pre-produced, you could say, sheet materials, extruded materials, into parts. The, the different disciplines within the building are very segregated. They're literally segregated into different zones, they're different materials, they're different trades. And unlike sort of biological systems, or you could argue highly optimized systems, they're not working in unison. They just do their own thing and they kind of work in between each other, but they don't work as one. And I think that with the advent of much more sophisticated uh, computer models of buildings where essentially everything is modeled in advance. You have the ability to integrate systems much more uh, than before. And something that is acting to bring air into a building could also be performing a structural role. 3D printing in timber and in plastic and in cable and in duct and in concrete and in steel and assembling these components clicked together uh, and, and that level of, of coordination was, was absolutely not possible before. An architect is always going to be interested in what kind of music can you play on this instrument, as opposed to let's just play, you know, the same old covers on a new instrument. A sense of kind of curiosity and playfulness that really allow the tool to be explored. Really pushing the tool and testing to see what it's capable of. Ben, thank you yeah. for a tour. Sure, absolutely.